Hi everyone, this is Alex from Near Protocol, and with me today is Alex from uh, from Fluence Labs. And we'll talk today about uh, decentralized databases. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself and share? Hi, oh, I'm Alex, and I work at Fluence as a researcher. And today, I guess I will talk about how to build structured data storage in a decentralized fashion. Cool. Would you like to give an overview? Yeah, sure. Um, so what we looked about, we looked at there are unstructured data storages in the like in decentralized ecosystem, but there is no many structured data storages. And so we thought that probably we should build something that will allow people to make queries to the data um, and basically be sure that like the results that are returned are correct. And um, to give you a brief, very brief overview how Fluence is structured, um, we have few different, like I would say, heterogeneous components here. So the first one is the thing that we call real-time layer. And the real-time layer consists of multiple small, let's put it this way, BFT clusters. So I, I can make one bigger. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's a BFT. One node is also a BFT. Um, so really small ones, really small clusters, the BFT ones. And um, because they are really small, there is a chance that some of these machines can you know, go wild. So in order to keep those guys in check, uh, we use a shared validation layer. And the validation layer is shared. We usually use this you know, symbol to depict a validator because it looks like V. Um, and this is um, basically shared validators pool. And we call this thing a security layer. And is it the same participants in both layers? Uh, well, I mean, they might be. I mean, you, you can have, I mean, you can have, this is different software in some kind of, but you can have this like one single hardware machine to run both a real-time node and a validator. So the way it works, I mean, how do those guys keep each other in check, is that real-time layer basically uploads um, every time when, oh well, there is also a client. And here's the client, and I'll draw a mobile phone. In the sense, that we want those clients to be thin. Like, I won't say light clients, but like at least thin clients. And um, so the light client, well, the thin client interacts with the real-time layer only. And every time, like the way how interaction goes, the client sends a request, which is like transaction essentially, and receives a response from the real-time layer. And for the validators for the security layer to verify the real-time layer, the real-time layer stores transactions into a decentralized storage. And for this purpose, um, we use like Swarm. We could also use Filecoin. I mean, honestly, right now we expect that in theory, those storages will support, like basically in like, if say for example, if you take a look at the Swarm paper, Swarm paper talks about how it can force nodes uh, to return you the data you have put there. Basically, it's how to guarantee that it will return the data there. And if it will not return you the data, then like these nodes will lose their deposits. But if you look at what Swarm does currently have in, you know, like deployed, they do not have this like incentivization layer. So we expect that eventually, once they have this feature, um, the data store there will be secure. But for now, we basically built on um, theoretical guarantees that it will be one day. Um, and we call this in the data availability layer. OK, so the not only, so first of all, the transactions are stored here. And I would say like transactions here are stored in blocks. So the data availability layer has basically keeps these real time layer blockchains. Um, 
also we store and in this case the block is just a set of transactions right right or right. queries rather uh same thing i see yeah I, I'll, I'll put transactions here not sure if it's visible enough so that's i would say the um transaction history And um, oh, is it going away? Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll call this transaction history. And also, this data availability layer stores states. So basically, state is a snapshot of the real time layer at some point. So, the way how stuff works uh, how frequently do you produce those snapshots? Right. So, I'll, 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 get, I'll get to this. So, the way how stuff works, um, the, the batch validator comes and it reads the like previous state snapshot, like say snapshot state M, and it reads a fragment of transaction history. And um, then it produces the new snapshot. And this new snapshot goes here, like into the storage. and. Oh, so the BFT clusters never produce snapshots. Right. It's only validators, right. I see. Right. Yeah, because like you you don't want those guys to produce snapshots. I mean, if even if you take like security aspect away, like I mean, producing a snapshot, uploading it here, it's a very different property from the like like real time. Oh, so you're saying it's more expensive? Yeah. Well, it's. I mean, it it basically will make the load on those classes irregular. I would say. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. So. The, those classes are used to, for example, a steady transaction, like incoming rate. But once they have to up upload the snapshot somewhere, that's kind of like mm -hmm. might decrease the ability to uh, process transactions. So no, those guys do not do not process snapshots. So only validators uh, produce snapshots. So yeah, they basically read those transactions, takes history and snapshots, and um, Producing a new snapshot. If during the block processing they do not agree with the <coughs> basically with the results they get, uh, they can file a dispute. So, but first of all, let me get to how do they not agree. So, in the end of the of each block, we like the currently here in the real time layer, uh, we use tender mint as the like BFT consensus agent essentially. So in Tendermint, after like in the end of each block, you also you not only put transactions there, you also put the hash of your state. And that's also is, is stored here in Swarm. So we have like for example after each block we have here hash virtual machine uh, n, hash of virtual machine sub n plus one, HVM sub n plus two and so on. So validators go over those blocks, and if basically when they are trying to apply a new block to the current state, if they produce a different hash, then they're like, okay, I mean, that doesn't work out. So let's um, basically point the gun at those guys. So when you're saying hash of virtual machine, so effectively you literally, the state, the state is not any sort of an abstraction. You're literally snapshotting the state of uh, like the memory dump no, I mean of the virtual machine that processes queries. No, no, no. I mean, like when when I'm saying hash, it means like the Merkle. Hash. Right, but what is virtual machine? Okay, good question. I forgot about that. Uh, so we use WebAssembly, and yeah, like every node has the same like virtual machine instance, and these like uh, like the me basically it's the memory of the virtual machine. Right. And yeah, we take the hash of this memory. Of the memory like, yeah, mm -hmm. of the of the yeah of the memory. And that hash is not merkleized in any way, right? It's just the hash. It's Merkle. It's Merkle. Okay. Yeah, it's Merkle. It's Merkle hash. Um, and anyways, so we've got like those guys read transactions and those guys read snapshots, and if they like, for example, one of those validators got instead of hash hash sub n, it got hash sub n prime. It clearly like doesn't match. And they submit a dispute. Uh, and they submit a dispute to Ethereum. OK. 
OK. So once the dispute is submitted to Ethereum, uh, well, those guys have to, well, I mean, Ethereum is obviously not able to download the entire state and is not able to download even the block, I would say, of transactions uh, to basically replay that. What those guys are doing, they are playing a concept called a uh, verification game. And that was basically um, proposed by Trubit. And the way it works, like, you execute your program instruction by instruction. And if at some instruction you found that you're, you're basically your states, you, you have achieved different state than your counterparty, then you say, well, this instruction is the bad one. And you don't have to do this like in a linear fashion. You can do like a bisect search. Um, so once those guys have found a bad instruction, uh, they take the chunk of the state that is um, was used by this instruction as an input. Like say, for well, I mean, let, let me explain. For example, if you have instruction i32 add, um, this instruction obviously uses the stack. It basically takes two values from the top of the stack here, and it then pushes one value back to the top of the stack, and it consumes those. So it's like pop two, and this is like push one. So in order for the like for the virtual machine on Ethereum to operate, you have to give it like this chunk of memory. And you also have to give it the chunk of memory where this stuff will be written. Do you effectively need to have the entire Wasm virtual machine written in Solidity? Mm, kind of, kind of, so, like, 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 a, like, a very, like a very small implementation of that. Actually, TrueBit guys almost already did nice. that. <laughs> but, but then you also need a hash function, which will be capable of uh, yeah. doing hashes where only part of the state changes, right? Well, it's still oh, but it's miracleized. It's, it's, it's miracleized, mm -hmm. yeah. So you you compute the, only the hash of the chunk, and um, then you compute the the entire hash. Mm -hmm. the, the problem is that it still might be too much for Ethereum smart contract, and so we are looking at how optimize that, um, because like the chunk like it might be four kilobytes, and transferring four kilobytes to Ethereum might not be also like mm -hmm. like the brightest idea. Um, anyways, so once those guys have pushed the thing to the virtual machine on Ethereum, uh, it basically executes the instruction, produces the new hash, and basically the machine that has a different hash has produced a different hash. Well, it loses its stake, essentially. Nice. Uh, I probably should talk about a little bit about timeouts because that might be, I would say, important for security. Or if you have, but, any but so so in terms of you saying that, mm -hmm. so so snapshot is created once every few blocks, right? Like ten thousand blocks, maybe. Yeah, let's like say let's say four for simplicity. Okay. Uh, so so we have snapshot here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have snapshot here. Sure. So, so in the model you described so far, there was a single validator who who did it, right? Oh yes, yes. There are multiple of them. But if but if there are multiple, which of them? Which state do you use as a kind of so multi, you're saying multiple validators will be assigned to this particular? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is it called? Fragment. Yeah, history fragment. That's yeah. mm -hmm. um, which. So each of them will produce the next state. Which one will be used as a canonical state? Well, if all of those validators agree, if all of them receive the same hash, mm -hmm. then like only the first one who has uploaded the state, like is, I mean, has to upload the state. If any of those validators disagree, they also have play the same verification game between each other. So like, you don't actually like either they all agree. Or like if there is some disagreement, then someone will like lose money. And and ha of all this information, what is actually snapshotted to Ethereum? Do I snapshot every block? Yeah, I see. And every snapshot as well. No, I mean, well, yes. Oh, wait, wait. Like a hash of every snapshot. Um, no. Okay, there is there is there is one more thing. Yeah, yeah. You. Because like you don't want to upload the hash of each block to Ethereum, that mm -hmm. also will be too expensive. So we have a separate layer, uh, which we probably uh, probably should talk about. Uh, let me, I mean, once we got to the validators model, mm -hmm. let me let let me describe that, I guess. Um, so uh, you have mentioned the like you have mentioned multiple validators. Right. So let me try to explain how that thing works. Um, so first of all, validators are selected completely 
bar random from the validators pool. Um, and the way it works, basically all of the active validators, they have to register on the Ethereum smart contract. And then you have a like random, random number generator that you can use uh, to choose one of those validators. And a validator, once it's like selected, it must, uh, it must um, execute the history fragment. Uh, otherwise, if it does not do that, within a certain timeout, which I probably should talk about. So I, I, will, I, I will put a reminder for myself here. Timeouts. Um, in, in this case, it will like lose a, like a small fraction of its deposit. Mm -hmm. It's like, it will not lose the entire deposit because it's like, like a minor offense, but it will lose like a fraction of that. Um, so the way it works, so once you have selected one validator, and this validator is verifying this BFT class array, um, now, you, after this validator, you also select another validator, and you also select this validator by random from the entire pool. And what else happens, like, once, when this validator is selected, it does not know um, if there will be another validation or not. So the way it works, we are saying that, if, like, the next validation will happen with the probability p. So this means, um, that because in this case it will be um, geometric distribution, in this case the uh, expected value of the number of validations will be p divided by one minus p. So if say for example you put, I don't know what here, like p equals four fifth, then in this case this will be four. Yeah. So you you can you you basically can can control the expected value of the number of validations. But the idea is that you, you, you don't really know if there will be another validator or not. So the validator that goes last, so here we probably will go get to the proof independent execution, which was proposed by Justin Drake. Uh, the idea was um, that each validator, when it validates, it has to provide, basically build, um, like, I would say, a fingerprint of the execution. And this fingerprint of the execution is um, specific to the like, to the, this validator only. So this validator will produce the proof P1, this will produce the proof P2, and this will produce the proof P3. And also while this validator is like performing the verification, it will like, well, this one, it will verify the proof of this validator. So because validators don't really know if there will be another validator after them or not, uh, they are um, um, like, I mean, they don't have much choice, but not to, like, but to right. produce the. So, so the idea that here is that uh, if I, as adversary, mm -hmm. control certain number of validators, mm -hmm. uh, there is never a moment for me when I'm certain that if if I fake all the so so let's say I manage to fake few validations up right, to a certain right, extent. Right. The idea is that even if I know that, even if I control the next validation, mm -hmm. I still have a risk that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, this one. That there's going to be at least one more. Right. But, but at some point, the chances not, not, are pretty not, low, not right? Not actually one more. Oh, wait. The, you're say, you're saying at every moment. So if there's this, if we manage to get to validation number five, then the, the, the probability of next is still four over five. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So the, the idea here is that the geometric distribution is memoryless. So if you are here, for example, the expected number of validations is four. Yeah. If you are here, for example, yeah. the expected number of validations is still four. Right. Yeah, it's like if you want a girl and you, you have a boy, you still have two kids before you get a girl. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, and basically, yeah, this guy doesn't know whether there will be a validation after him or like which validator it But But importantly, will be. the probability of the next validation is always high. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, but, and also you, I mean, you can, you can also improve the thing by forcing not only this validator to verify this one, but also like this for data to verify the, like this one, the proof independent execution. But what is the motivation to, to be, like probabilistically, mm -hmm. they will obviously execute stuff. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if, you do very, if you verify the proof of the independent execution, mm -hmm. most likely you just waste resources, right? Right. What's the motivation to verify it? Well, in our case, the idea was basically to make the computation of the proof independent execution really, like the overhead really low. So you don't have a, like an incentive to remove that. And also, the idea is like 
if you catch this guy, like that this guy has produced an incorrect proof of Nibin execution, then, well, you, you, you will get a fraction of, its, like, of this guy deposit. But I mean, yeah, I mean, in theory, like, you could, like, I, I would expect someone to go and modify the source code and remove this, like, proof in the execution verification. Oh, so the idea right now is that if I'm validator number five, right. as I'm executing the code of the query, mm -hmm. whenever I need to compute my, well, we didn't go much into proof of independent execution, right. but whenever I need to compute my hash of the state, mm -hmm. uh, in the present binary, I will also compute hash of everybody else. Yeah. And you're saying the incentive to recompile the binaries. It's like very low. So yeah. the, the overhead is very low. And, um, and you also have some, like, you can also receive some money from those guys. Yeah. And also, it also might happen that if, for example, and I, I mean, that's, it has, like, you, you can see, like, this approach might have it, like, certain flaws here. So if you have this guy who is verifying this proof independent execution, let's say this proof independent execution was not correct, and then this guy came and didn't check that, mm -hmm. and then this guy is coming and it no, so actually found that it's incorrect, then this guy is like, okay, I. I, I have something to lose here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you, maybe you can improve it like that. Are you saying that that also works as a motivation for, for the second validator? Yeah, to, like, to, pr to actually verify mm -hmm. the proof. Um, OK, let me probably talk about timeouts. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is also like a, like a potential like, you know, problems here. So the way, so first of all, before talking about timeouts, I probably should talk about like few accounting. So we use very similar like approaches like what Ethereum does. We use a uh, few. So the um, but here we have a kind of different thing. Um, instead of forcing clients to pay for few, we have a developer who is uh, paying to the not not like to only the real time layer, but to the entire like to the entire you know validation and real time layer processing. And the way how few works. A uh, few accounting works. So first of all, there is like a complexity of instructions, which is like very really, like similar to what you found like in Ethereum. Although we have complexity of WebAssembly instructions, and but second thing is, um, so first you have algorithmic complexity, and the second thing is um, amount of allocated memory. So. Be, these machines, they have to allocate memory. We haven't, like, well, for, f like, right now, we, we are focused only on the memory, like, you know, in-memory stuff. We haven't really touched disk much, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but you, for example, can tell those guys, I need four gigabytes of memory. Or when, once when assembly supports more, you can say, I want, like, 32 gigabytes of memory. Um, but anyway, like, y the developer can have control over how much memory uh, she wants to allocate, and um, yeah, so there is memory. But the problem with memory is memory is not really like if you if you calculate the algorithmic complexity of the like WebAssembly program, it's like equal to work, like I mean in the physical sense. Uh, but memory is equal to power. Yeah, that's way beyond my knowledge of physics. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I see what you're saying. Yeah, so it's like it's like how how much do, have you allocated? Mm -hmm. But if you allocated like four gigabytes for one nanosecond, that's probably not worth much. Mm -hmm. And if you allocated four gigabytes for you know like a year, right. that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So we multiply this thing by time. But okay. you don't know in advance how much time you need, right? W what happens if, if right. my deposit? And you out? also don't have a notion of like a good notion of time in decentralized systems. Mm -hmm. So how stuff works here, uh, we kind of replace the thing a little bit. So this is. Um, uh, let, me, let me think what was the symbol. Oh, anyways, let, let me say this is like eta. Like how much the program, like the complexity of the program that was executed. Like in a, for example, single like block. Mm -hmm. So you can multiply this eta by some coefficient and you will get some kind of standard time here. Okay. I mean, yeah. How much yeah. How much? How much? How much? How much? How much? Like processing time it spent. Yeah. How yeah. much time it would have taken on a standard hardware to mm. execute this program, mm -hmm. and uh, then you take this standard time and mu multiply by memory, and you get like how much you have to like the, a developer has to pay for memory. How much? How much memory they used at that particular time? Yeah. yeah. But then, but then also, if you if the query has some 
footprint on the state, right. that memory will be downloaded by every consecutive real-time layer person or validator, right? Yeah, yeah. So the way the way it works, so we, we have we have this thing, and we also, I mean, remember we have spoken that we have to compute the hash of the virtual machine, mm -hmm. and we also said that the hash is like miracleized, is a miracleized thing. So imagine that that you, for example, need to put to perform a single put request, like write just one byte into the memory, but your memory is like four gigabytes, and your chunks are probably like four kilobytes. Let's let's say let's say it like that. So now, I don't know, probably. Are you saying the memory is pre-allocated? Yeah, the memory is okay, pre-allocated. Okay, four gigabytes is pre-allocated. Yeah, I yeah. See. Th those guys are like yeah, four gigabytes are pre-allocated. And imagine that. But let let me show you like the the, the issue here. Um, you have the say for example you have a Merkle tree, and oh maybe I don't really need this layer. And this Merkle tree has like eight chunks, each like four kilobytes. And I'm going to write. I'm as a developer have written a program that writes a single byte into chunk. So now, if I'm just calculating the algorithmic complexity of this thing, it's quite low. So writing one byte is pretty small, has pretty small complexity. But recomputing the Merkle hash of this chunk and this one and this one, like and basically propagating all the way to the top, is like pretty expensive because you also have to calculate the hash of this thing and this and this and so on. And so, on. so we also charge for, we call it, for dirty in chunks. So every time when you write to a chunk, this chunk is like markets dirty. But it's much, not, not, not much different from writing a single byte to, to a page which is not in the cache, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's, 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 kind, of, that's kind of similar to, like, to the just normal hardware. So, so, so it's your, as a developer, you're responsible to, yeah. to make sure you're writing to so co-located. Yeah, basically you have like aligned calls mm -hmm. and, and like writing to the same, like trying to write to the same page of memory. So anyways, but so we have like uh, price for dirty in chunks, and basically that's also um, goes into this formula. Dirty chunks multiplied by like some another coefficient. And that's the entire price. Like that's the entire fuel price, how much a developer has to pay for that. And um, it, the developer might be, might be compensated or might not be compensated for like this service. Well, it's up to them to monetize price. it, right? Yeah, yeah. So you, you but, but how, how would users not saturate their, uh, their allowance? Like developer will not be paying infinite amount of money, right? There is some right. allowance. Mm -hmm. Why would I not come with a single phone and just saturate everybody's allowance? Yeah, but that's very similar to how like modern web works. So, so again, it's up to, it's up to developer to, to properly expose it. And right, I right, see. right. So I mean, if you say, for example, have deployed a backend into like centralized data center, then I can make a DDoS attack on you, and that. But anyways, I mean, I mean, here we have a central developer role here, which is kind of makes things a little bit centralized. But you can make it more decentralized by saying, well, each client has to pay a like to use this service. Clients need to pay a developer, like say, for example, like once in a month, some sum, or pay for each transaction. Like somehow, basically, if the flow of clients is high enough, then you don't really need a developer here. Like, you just have a contract that stores like some kind of balance here. But uh, like these guys, they really don't care who's paying, right? Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. they well, they just need money to like to operate. And and, and also before we go to timeout, uh, mm -hmm. these people never rotate, right? Yeah. So I well, I mean, they 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 can. But 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 that's not how it is implemented, right? So so if if I have my own day, if there's a data set or any computation I want to do. I pre-select these validators. You can do that. You can do that. And those people, they constantly rotate. Those I never choose, mm -hmm. and they never choose me. Yes, yes. I mean, so we haven't, so honestly, we haven't digged much into like how real time could rotate. So for now, we are like, well, yeah, developer can choose the node that is more like, I don't know, like has the higher like availability reputation or something. Or better link to them. Yeah, or better, or better link to clients. But uh, we are, we can, we can say that those like this layer is not necessarily, you know. I mean, it might be taken over by malicious adversary. Like, it, it, it might happen. What's important that this layer, like, developer doesn't have any control over this layer. But, but then the, the interesting question is, this validator, right? Mm -hmm. the, whenever they get assigned to a fragment, the very first thing they do is they then load the whole snapshot right, right. Of, the, of the virtual machine right. just to perform some number of transactions, which right. I guess is relatively small, it's right? We, we actually want to make it relatively high. 
relatively high, okay. But still, effectively, that implies that rotation is very possible, right? So, so wouldn't would it not make sense? Like, let, let's say I want my speed layer to be more secure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would it not make sense for me to say I want a BFT consensus of four people? I don't care about link or availability, but I want more security. I want those to rotate. Because clearly they can, right? In principle, I mean, I mean, they, they they could in principle, but as you as you mentioned, that those guys have to read down. I mean, so uh, maybe I should write it like that. So these guys are stateless, mm -hmm. and these guys are stateful, right? Uh, and um, but but like, let's say let's say I chose, um, let's say I chose to have one validator in my tendermint mm -hmm. consensus group. Mm -hmm. And then I chose to have, uh, let's say, it's like probability six over seven, so we're going to get six, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It sounds very suspicious. I oh, know that's all good. Um, that means I'm already paying uh, for six people mm -hmm. to every now and then go and load my state right. and validate, right. right? So in essence, let's say that instead mm -hmm. I drop this guy, or like I keep this guy, doesn't matter, but I make those six people to to be more real time. I'm, I'm telling them to download the state state a little in advance. Uh, and then validate in real time for the same amount of time. Mm -hmm. That would give me slightly less security in a sense that the uh, the master of puppets. Well, right. you you cannot choose those guys. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I'm but you see what I'm saying, right? Uh, I, I'm I'm losing a little bit of security because the master of puppets now during that epoch while they validate me, mm -hmm. they they know them all, and so they know exactly whom to corrupt. So, so we're losing we're losing that advantage of the last validator, right? So, so I'm losing that, but what I'm gaining is that my speed layer is significantly more secure, right? Okay, let's let's think about this. So, first of all, we like that was the idea, like mm. to not let anyone like to tamper with this layer. So, like no one actually has control over this layer. Right. Uh, so we didn't really want this. And the um, second thing, let me think about this. So this validator will go here and take the state, right? And it will, I mean, the question is like, how do often do you like rotate those guys? Because but let, let's say we rotate them as often as they, uh, they, they are like they would, they would do as many queries as they do today, effectively. Okay. Oh, the problem is that here when they validate, the queries are condensed, right? And if it's real time, the queries are sort of coming at, mm -hmm. at a significantly. Well, I mean, what, what, could, what could be done? Let me, let me think what could be done here. You can say take this validator, and like no, no not not you take this validator. Mm -hmm. Once this validator is selected and has downloaded the state, and applied it and produced a new state, maybe you could replace this node with this. Oh wait, actually this validator will be lagged, because it, yeah. But but they can download state a little bit in advance. Like effectively, what you do is you download state like half an hour before you would have to start validating. But you don't know that you will be validating. W well. Let's say you say you, they somehow do know. Right, but this will break the assumption that no one controls this layer. I mean, I'm, I'm not. Well, technically, someone does control this layer today. Like, th there's, this, there's the Ethereum chain with randomness which says, right. you validate right. this now. Right. So, what will change that in Ethereum, instead of saying you validate it now, says you validate it in half an hour from now. So, you have time to download state, catch up, and oh. maintain it in sync, right? Yeah, that, that would probably work. Yeah. That would probably work. So, so, so here, the trade off is. The security will be slightly less. Right, Th that's right. that's like that's a philosophical question. Is right. it the case that, uh, like like if someone can corrupt mm -hmm, mm -hmm. two thirds of my seven node cluster, in principle they can, yeah. like tamper with people who get assigned to the to validate my data set. But what I get is that my speed layer is fast, right? Mm. In a, oh, sorry, my speed layer is secure. Is is more secure? Yeah. yeah, I guess. I guess. I mean, I would probably want to like right. like to sit down and do some math on that. But, but there is also, here, here's another mm -hmm. uh, sort of consideration, which is, um, so those validators, you chose them from some pool, right? Right. And presumably that pool, it is unlikely that you happen to, to sample two thirds plus one malicious actors, yeah. or like even one third plus one, depends on where you draw the line. Mm -hmm. um, so we expect that it will only break if a malicious actor can somehow reach out to them and corrupt them adaptively, right? What do you mean by that? By adaptively, I mean that when I when I created, so let's say this is my cluster. It has seven nodes. Mm -hmm. When I created it, it is extremely unlikely that they were that the cluster was corrupted. Mm -hmm. uh, so the secure layer protects me against right. someone, let's call them an adversary, yeah, yeah. 
an adversary somehow re reached out to them. Mm -hmm. So they, they, like, for example, let's say all the validators are sitting in the same Discord channel. Right. right. right? So they went to the Discord channel, and, and they said, if you're validating this the cluster, I will give you your yes. stake x2 for your yes. private key. Yes. Right? So that's what we're trying to protect against. Um, OK. Uh, the thing is that uh, clearly this validator knows that they will be validating your mm -hmm. um, uh, your particular fragment for a while, right? So let's so let's say you want them to validate for like two hours in a row. Okay. That means there is two hours during which the validators themselves knows that they are validating the fragment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You you can do some smart construction so that nobody else knows until they publish, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. but they know. Mm -hmm. That's that's what is important. Mm -hmm. So now as an adversary, what I will do is I will go to Discord, mm -hmm. and I will publish a smart contract on Ethereum where if you prove right. that you got assigned to this. Uh, to this fragment, and you provided your private key, you, you get your stake x2, right? right? So I still can adaptively corrupt. I mean, I'm still risking something, right? Because I could adapt this person, but I don't know if there's going to be next one, or rather, I don't know if they will be corruptible. But if, I'm, if I really want to. I mean, if you really want to. Sp I mean, so here's the thing. If you really want, well, first of all, two things. Because this guy knows that someone else will be verifying mm -hmm. him, and this guy might not really know that, like, whether this guy will actually, you know, like be corrupted. Uh, be corrupted. But, but I'm paying him stake x2. Yeah, right. like, like he has an incentive. And if an adversary is willing to spend the like all the stake in this attack, then yes. Like the adversary can all the stake of seven people yeah, all out people. of like a few hundred, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean it's it's basically we can tell um like the developer a price. We, basically the developer knows that those guys have put that much stake and the auditors will put like that much stake, and the developer knows that. If someone spends more than this stake, the, yeah, then probably the results that like the entire layer produces like will not work. But but if this is the price that developer, if this is the security the developer gets, then obviously they can just put everybody onto the speed layer. You still need to spend uh, as much. No, the I, I would probably say that the um, in this case you so for this case in the speed layer you need to corrupt two thirds of the class for things like to work. In the security layer, you have to corrupt, I guess, everyone. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you will be like, so it's like, uh, basically corrupt all. And I would probably say that if you put everyone here, so let's, let's consider two situations. You have seven nodes in real time, and you have- One uh, real time, six yeah, validators. Yeah. Exactly, like one real time, six validators. I would probably say that this is like, Slightly better, like. But, but but also, to an extent, it depends on how how much we believe in the power of the adaptive adversary, right, right, right. because uh, obviously you cannot expect all the six validators to be online. So an adversary can provide them a choice. They can either get corrupted for two x stake and lose the stake, or they can just skip their step. Oh, you, you for like one tenth no, of no, the no, stake. No, 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 you cannot. You cannot. Like, I mean, if one of those validators skips the stack, like he skips the validation, then another validator anyway. will be selected. Yeah. You, you always have to do six validators, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But but let's say mm -hmm. we make small step. Let's say we removed completely the mm -hmm. security layer mm -hmm. or a sh shared validator pool. Yeah. Uh, but we made, but in the tendermint consensus, we're saying that, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, let's say you corrupted two thirds, but we're still making like the remaining participants can still challenge, right? They can still fish. Yeah. I presume. Yeah, they could. Even uh, well, even today, actually, right? Actually, let me think about this. So, so what you're risking is if two of them are literally offline for some reason. So, let me let me think about this. So, I guess what what could be done here. Um. So here's the thing. So let's say, for example, those guys like, are corrupted, mm -hmm. and in this case, they don't even not need to talk to the like to the rest of the two uh, to reach consensus. Like because those mm -hmm. guys, like those guys, like the, like those are enough to have consensus. But we presume that Swarm has some right, way to, right. to say that the data is not available. So the right, two guys right. will, they will not say block is invalid. They will say, mm -hmm. the, the the data is not available. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So I guess if those guys, uh, let me think about this. So I guess if those guys uh, save to the, if those guys save everything to the data like availability layer, then these could, yeah, I mean they are not in the consensus. But they're like, well, someone has cut us out, and they can go here and download the data and be like, I challenge, I, I like, I challenge you. I would probably say that's, I would probably say that's quite possible. So what we lose, so effectively, if I understand everything correctly, the the only thing we're losing in this approach is that 
the adaptive adversary has full information on whether the attack will be successful yeah. before the attack. Like effectively, they can choose not to attack until they have full control. While uh, with the, with the, with the shared data right. pool, you like those guys are selected on completely random. Right. And I mean, if I mean, here's the thing: if you're saying that an adversary can post a Discord channel and say, like, basically every valid, like all of the six validators here will be like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm corruptible. But you know why validators validating, right? Yeah. That's not because they like Fluence or Cosmos or whatever they're validating. It's because they want money. So well, if someone goes to Discord and says, here's more money. Right, right, right. But I, I would probably say that's, a, that's also like a philosophy. Right. If you are saying that all six of them are corruptible, then yeah, probably right. that's pretty bad. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's an uncommon opinion that you can have like large percentage corruptible. But, but it sort of sounds reasonable if you think about it. Um, well, I mean, maybe there will be some. Well, I mean, but but ultim usually, ultimately, usually it's up to the up to the developer. Yeah. Usually, we are basically saying that, like, what, like one third of the validators are corruptible or like malicious. Oh, that, that like that's extremely optimistic. Or like, or like like ten percent of them are, yeah. But but yeah, I agree. Like, if all of them are can be corrupted, then. But but the idea here is if, if the developer, like, it's the developer who chooses the security, right? If they if they believe that more than fifty percent are corruptible, yeah, um, not much they can do anyway. Yeah. And also, I would probably say that, yeah, the stakes that the validators have put, they are basically kind of saying, well, you can expect that much security. If an adversary, like, say, for example, all of those nodes have put, like, 10K in a, as a security deposit, if someone is willing to spend 70K, you know, to break the thing, like, 50. like well, yeah, you're right, like, 50. Well, no, actually, like, you also need to corrupt yeah. those, mm -hmm. like, 70K. Then yeah, probably like you should like if your if your application is that mission critical, you probably should require those guys to put more stake. Yep. And yeah. Cool. Um, okay, now let's talk about timeout. Yeah, let's talk about timeouts. So we have just discussed like that the like we have fuel, and the fuel is basically constituted from three components. And the first component is uh, how like what the algorithmic complexity was of the program. Second component is how much memory was allocated for how much time. And the third one is like how many chunks of the memory were like made dirty. So now you have calculated, let's say you have calculated fuel. And once you once you basically have calculated fuel, you can like we are trying to turn this fuel into the timeout. Because we said here that a validator must validate within a certain time. Um and um like, if the validator does not validate in a certain time, then a fraction of his deposit is, like, slashed. Like a, like a small fraction, like one th like one hundredth, one thousandth, one ten thousandth. Um, so how the timeout is calculated, we basically take the fuel. And here's the thing. The fuel is declared by this cluster. Because you, you, you cannot really know how much fuel will be spent uh, without actually per executing the program. But, but once, you, once you validate, if you exceeded fuel, you just Stop right. What's that? So as a validator, yeah. Let me yeah let me let me let me let me show you like a potential issue here. So those guys say for example have like they. I mean okay let me let me talk about the timeouts, and I probably should clear some space here. Yeah, that's probably good enough. So let's let's talk about timeouts. So let's say I have I have fuel and I've got the timeout, which is equal to like some constant by fuel, and this constant is like chosen large enough, like maybe ten times more than you would expect at like an average node, to like hundred uh, well not, maybe not hundred times but like twenty four times more than you would expect an average validator uh, to take, and you can say well if you guys are slower than that well don't even consider joining the network, so. Now you have the real-time cluster. And it might happen that the real-time cluster says, well, I have spent that much fuel, but this fuel is much less than the like true amount of fuel that is required to perform the computation. So now, and this fuel is written here in like in those blocks. How much time, how much fuel was spent for like each of those blocks. So now you can say, if I want to validate a fragment of history, I need to spend like that much fuel. But if the real-time cluster was lying about the fuel spent, then the timeout that will be given to the validator is like really small. 
And for this, we have like few disputes. So once a validator comes and notices that he was given a really like small amount of time, it can execute a few disputes. And a few disputes is very similar to the just normal verification game dispute. You basically saying, like, say for example, these are two. These are two like like this is a real time cluster and this is a validator, and after each like WebAssembly instruction, you can say, hey, that's how much fuel uh, has left. Like, I mean, was 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 spent actually. But that's not how I will attack you. If I'm a real-time cluster, yeah. I will just upload a seven terabytes file. You will not even get to WebAssembly step. Well, let me think about this. You upload a seven gigabyte file, terabyte, terabyte. terabyte file so to swarm. You would you will you will upload it to swarm. Right. Okay, let let's get to this. Um, that's a that's an interesting question. Oh, but that but swarm can 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 provide an attestation on the size. On the size, I'm not. I'm not sure. I guess, I guess if Swarm can do that, I'm that would be your sure. dispute, right? Yeah. Well, we probably, well, I, I don't know the answer right now. So probably we need to think about this. So let, let's finish with this and then think how we uh, how this can attack can be solved. So anyways, for the timeout attack, you can say each of those guys, once this guy has found that he spent more fuel than this guy, you can say, well, I want a dispute on this part of execution. And then you do the same by sex search. And you find the instruction that has produced diversion amounts of fuel, and like the real time class in this case will, you know, lose state. Uh, so for the so for the timeouts here, um, I would say that yeah. Let me think. But but uh, you, yeah. if something is wrong, like let's say fuel is improperly recorded. Within the timeout, you just need to initiate the verification game, right? You don't need to finish it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and you, 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 you're not also only given like this timeout. You also have some, you know, like some time to download the state. The, mm -hmm. Like I mean, the, but that is all included, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To download, well, not input in few. You probably need like another constant here. I see. Yeah, because like this is if you put few zero, then you don't have any time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for the timeout. What what kind of a problem might happen here? That the like data availability layer, like if an adversary tries to corrupt the data availability layer and say, hey, do not return any like any data to the validators, so they time out essentially, uh, that might have a, like might might become a problem. Right. And I think But in this case case the system will just stall, right? Well, no. Uh, like if no validator can validate yeah, I would probably say yeah, I would probably say that you will, like, the the mali malicious real time class in this case will never get caught, probably. Well, actually, the adversary will have to pay these guys. But 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 as a developer, you will know something is wrong because, um, like, for a long period of time, you're not yeah. receiving any validation results. Yeah, you, you you will probably see that because basically, if an adversary will have to pay for the like to the data availability, like to bribe those nodes to return the data. But it will have to bribe them for like indefinite amount of time because like once those nodes like start returning the data, they will like essentially like these guys will actually come and like some like there will be another validator that will be able to download the data and eventually someone will lose like a deposit. And also with this like with remember we s we said there will be like multiple validations, so the stakes of the real time nodes. Are not released until the like I mean the real time nodes that have produced this like history fragment they will not be released until like there is a, like a last validation was completed. So if an adversary is paying to someone to you know um, like to not return the data, then stakes of these guys will never be unlocked, and this essentially would be similar to like just paying those guys their stakes. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, you have asked about the, I think, about what if, let's say, yeah, let's think about this. What if those guys have uploaded uh, like a really big like transaction file? Uh, you probably can compute the proof, like you probably can build the proof of the size. Well, if Swarm can attest to the size, there's, there's already quite a bit of reliance on Swarm, so yeah. it's I not going to get any worse. I, I think I think it should, I think it should. But 
or what what else can you do? You can also say, for example, you can also build a Merkle. I mean, how uh, essentially like how Swarm could do that, I guess. You could build a Merkle tree, like on like on top of this file. And once you have like, if say for example, the thing said the file is like one megabyte, but you have downloaded like already ten megabytes and it's not has not you know finished, then you have downloaded the, the chunks that are required to build the Merkle proof that these chunks belong to the like hash of the Merkle tree. And now you can actually prove that the but size of the file they, is big. They uploaded an invalid Merkle root. In a, what's that? They uploaded an invalid, like they actually have a one megabyte file, yeah. which they never uploaded. And for the one megabyte file, they do have the Merkle. Oh, that's, 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 actually, like, that's actually an interesting case. I mean, we, <laughs> okay, so let's, let's, let's also talk about this. Mm -hmm. uh, the Merkle, what's, what's important here is that the Merkle tree of the, I mean, here's where the, the discrepancy might come from. So there is a hash of this thing. And swarm, so there are actually two hashes. OK, let's, let's, let's get to this. There are two hashes, actually. And the first hash is the virtual machine hash. That's the Merkle root. Yeah, that's one of the Merkle roots. Mm -hmm. But there is also a swarm hash. That's just something that swarm gave you back. Right, and that's something that swarm attests that it will return to you. Um, Th this is by no means Merkleized, right? I think, no, they are, they are Merkleized. It is Merkle. Yeah. Oh, Swarm has a. M yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and those hashes can be computed with different chunk sizes and more or like even like different hash functions. So effectively, you can you can provide one VM hash yeah. and upload a different <laughs> file. So a validator, a val like what a validator can do, like this guy can come and download, like say for example, it has produced a new state, and it says yes, the state of the like I agree with the state of the virtual machine that is written here. But it then uploads a not matching file, a not matching state file to here. And in this case, and because those hashes are different, it's not like, I mean, I, well, I didn't know of an easy way uh, how to prove that this hash doesn't match this. But if swarm hash is Merkleized, why do you have your own hash? Well, it's, it might be just different hash function. I mean, yes, we could, we could make this hash function compatible. But what we are saying here is that, well, maybe we'll it might actually happen that the hash functions will be different. Um, so what we have thought about is that the next, like, I mean, there will be, there will always be the next validator, like either the one that is re-verifying this guy or the validator that is like verifying the next history fragment that will download this file. And once it downloads the file, it there is a way how to prove that this file, um, like, uh, that the file available by this swarm hash does not really correspond to this virtual machine hash. You you will just like yeah. You 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 will just basically find a diversion like like chunk in the in the. And in to the be very specific, if the next validator is re-verifying, re they're not downloading the file; they're uploading the same file, right? Oh yeah, but I mean, once they are ready to upload the file, they can compute the swarm hash right. and see well if the swarm hash matches this one, and if it does not, they can also like do a dispute here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not. What what was that? Timeouts? Yeah, we have talking about. Yeah, I think we covered most of the things. Yeah, I think I think so. Cool. Yeah, yeah, we can wrap up the technical discussion here. Okay. We always ask one non-technical question at the end, okay. which is, okay. when is when is the main net? Uh, How far are you? I think the beginning of 2020, I guess. Yeah. It's 2019 right now. So yeah, like beginning of 2020, yeah. that's our target, I would say. And you have a DevNet, right? Yeah, we Everyone do. We can do. go yeah. download, play with it. Yep, yep, yep. Cool. But you can play with the real-time clusters, and the security layer is like on its way. I see. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.